Fox Sports, and we do it again here today. Tim Brando, Fox Sports. Tim, we're, it's Halloween, as you know, so I bought a bunch of candy randomly at a convenience store. We're having a candy, like a, a tournament. We're down to <laughs> one of the picks is Snickers against Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Which one of those two, if you even have or like either one of them, which one would you choose? I'm not crazy about either, but I would take Snickers. Okay. What All is right. your favorite? I'm not crazy about either one. All right. What, what? is your favorite? Oh, oh wow, look at that. Oh, my God. And me, too. And yeah. Our audience, Tim. They, number two. Number two. Number two. Number two. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. That, that They played each other in the first round. How about two blue bloods yeah. going up against each other? And, and Butterfinger. <laughs> hey, I want to yeah. start with a non-college football story. I uh, my favorite player in the history of life in baseball was Frank Howard. Mm-hmm. And I saw your post yeah. about Frank Howard. I lived in Virginia. My dad was at the Pentagon when they were the senators, moved, of course, to Arlington, a gentle giant who was a phenomenal home run hitter, a hell of a player with the Dodgers. And I saw your post. I love that. Your remembrance or your memories and thoughts about Frank Howard, Hondo as they called him. Yeah, I just, I was always upset that we didn't get to see him most of the time. If you lived where we lived in baseball in those days, you didn't get to see him until the All-Star game. Mm-hmm. It was almost as if he didn't play until the All-Star game. Uh, and I remember the bat a little bit like, um, you know, you remember uh, Richie Allen, Dick Allen? He yep. always had a, a really heavy, heavy bat. They always talked about how many ounces his bat was, and yet he swung it like it was a toothpick. Even more so, Frank Howard, his arms and his hands were so big, and I think he he did not swing as heavy a bat as um, as Allen did. It looked like a toothpick, you know, in his uh, in his hands. And I think probably the two most intimidating left-handed hitters from the generation I grew up in were. Willie McCovey and Willie Stargell in that order. I thought those two guys were just menacing uh, at the plate. From a right-handed standpoint, though, Frank Howard, without a doubt, was the guy. I mean, he just <laughs> he was a mountain of a man, you know. And uh, I just remember watching those World Series, and, and I would always get mad in the fourth inning when they would, you know, almost always the starters would play three innings and that was it, and they'd yep. bring other guys in. And I was like, I want to see Frank Howard bat four times, please. Just don't take him out. <laughs> because, uh, and in those days when we were growing up, you know, you didn't miss the All-Star game. No. I mean, it was required viewing uh, for kids back in uh, in our generation. So, uh, I uh, I never saw him play in person. I saw McCovey and Stargell and a lot of the other guys of that generation play in person. And, uh, of course, when I started calling baseball games, uh Guys like, um, you know, Ozzy Smith were mm-hmm. still playing. And uh, I got to know a lot of the greats during that period. Most of them became managers. Uh, when Dusty uh, when Dusty Baker decided to call it a career at, with the Astros after the ALCS, I bemoaned the fact that he was leaving because he was the last connection for me with the Braves. When I was uh, nine years old, I was a bat boy for the Shreveport Braves, the double-A Farm Club in the Texas League was in Shreveport. And uh, Dusty and Ralph Gar, Wayne Garrett, who was later traded to the Mets the very year they went to the series, and he platooned at third base with Eddie Charles when they beat uh, the Orioles in 69. I was 13 years old. I I, I, I got the bat boy for Dusty Baker when I was uh, 12 years old. I mean, that's 11, 12 years old. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. That is cool. And he was that – and he was uh, – uh, just a, uh, I do remember just how, uh, what a gentleman he was, you know, how, what a cool guy he was and, uh, old Spar stadium where the Braves played and later the Shreveport captains played it was an old stadium that was run by the city. And, uh, it was a thrill for me to get to play in, uh, American Legion ball in that ballpark because I'd seen all these big leaguers play there. Rocky Calavito had come in when I was about nine years old. Denny McLean actually pitched in Shreveport when the Brewers had the farm club and he was trying to get back to the, um, to the big leagues after he threw out his arm in Detroit. That happened in 71, 72. I was in high school and I was playing Legion ball in that ballpark uh, at that time. So a lot of great memories of, of minor league baseball and, 
and um, and those guys that played in in that generation. And I was David. I was one of those guys that I took the Sporting News. I knew all the. I knew who was playing where. Mm-hmm. I could tell you the batting averages of the guys playing in the American Association, Pacific Coast League, <laughs> and I was also a player. So I was I was I was a I was a sports nerd, and I also was an athlete. I played baseball, you know, all the way through high school, and um, you know, stopped in college because I knew I was going to be better talking about it than playing it. But you know, growing up, you know, you you felt like if you were going to be a sportscaster for a career you were going to have to do baseball because there was no ESPN back then. There were no national jobs. And the only sport that lasted long enough that you could have a full blown sports casting career was baseball. So I think that was all of our first loves back in, in our generation. Tim, uh, I, uh, I have a quick Willie McCovey story. I think it's pretty funny. I went the only time I've been to AT&T park. It was actually on Willie McCovey's birthday on Willie McCovey mm. night. And we had our, where our seats were, we had to take an escalator to get there. And it was very dark in the, like in the, in the concourse. So my friends uh-huh. and I are riding up on the escalator and there was a, a very large man standing in front of us, but it was dark and you couldn't see anybody anywhere. We get off the elevator and then the, like the entire like concourse erupts in applause. And my <laughs> buddy who's about six beers deep behind me goes, what the hell's going on? And then like uh-huh. the sunshine hits his face. And I was like, Oh crap. It's Willie McCovey. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, awesome. Yeah. Everybody was That's like, awesome. people were grabbing like, Oh, is he signing autographs? I'm like, I don't know. I was just behind him on the escalator. I'm not with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, great. Time. Yeah. I, I would have, I think probably most you know, because he was so large, so tall. Uh, and no, most baseball players, when they're out of uniform, sort of blend in with the crowd. You know, they're mm-hmm. not necessarily not like NFL players or NBA players. Uh, but McCovey would have been one of those guys. <laughs> I think if you had gotten him from an angle, you might have known it was was the yeah he uh, was just, stretch. Just a tall know? guy in front of me. <laughs> That's all I thought. Yeah. Was- <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's a great story. So you uh, <laughs> you you heard Dabo and maybe his reaction to a caller, and then of course today there was a little bit more of a lighter mood, but he he kind of doubled down. What are your thoughts uh, about he reacted? You've hosted coaches shows. My goodness, some don't take calls, some do, some take emails. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts about his reaction last night? Well, I you know given the fact that the caller was um, it was one of those almost like a, a Twitter slash X, if you want to call it that moment for, for a phone call in show. Uh, I would, I would certainly talk to my screener. If I was the uh, Clemson athletic department, if they're running that show, I'd talk to my, my screener about how he got duped. But um, I didn't think that he said anything that was, was too, too out of order. He may have gone on a little too long. Yeah. And he may have defended himself too much, but um, I didn't have a problem with what he said. The gist of it being, um, and my takeaway from it being, uh, the level of expectation does not match up with the level of appreciation. I I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. Um, It's a byproduct of today's culture, uh, the, the rancor and anger that so many people in our country have about a lot of other things spills over into sports. Now I see it every week on my Twitter feed, you know, just some smart aleck SOB that wants to, uh, to say something yesterday, somebody uh, just, you know, trying to troll and, you know, said, um, you know, he he came after me and I said, uh, well, I'm in the business and this is what I think. He said, Oh, you are. I, uh, I didn't know that. I, I, I thought you were gone. You know, that kind of thing. Mean spirited stuff comes up all the time, and uh, he he reacted emotionally to it because he's on, he's energized, he's got his adrenaline flow going because he's it's his show, it's got his name on it, and so I can see how he would react the way that he did. It lasted maybe a little longer than it should have. I, I think sometimes what's missing today for a lot of these coaches is a buffer. They don't have um, uh, a publicist expert that they trust near and dear to them the way in the old days they once did. Mm -hmm. There was an old uh, SID at Clemson for many, many years, Bob Bradley, who used to handle Frank Howard and then later handled uh, Danny Ford. And if Bob Bradley were alive, he would have counseled Dabo before he he went on the air and he would have said something along the lines of, hey, uh, 
just say it once and move on to the next guy. You know, just say it one time and move on because the longer this lasts, the more attention to him and to this you're paying. And you don't, that's not what your purpose is. That's not what you are trying to achieve. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, college football coaches are surrounded by yes men uh, and yes women that are there to just uh, shake their heads and agree with whatever the coach says. There's no one next to the coaches any longer that's giving them some difficult truths, uh, some things to make them uh, maybe look in the mirror and see that per- perhaps that they are not doing themselves any favors either. Um, if that were the case, I think he might have handled it a little more quickly and succinctly and moved on. I, that would be my one critique, that it lasted too long. Uh, and he gave this young, he gave this young troll uh, too much uh, energy and, and, and too many headlines the day after which is the last thing that our country needs and the last thing that these clowns need. There was a time, uh, David, when I would uh, try too hard to, to, um, to get people on social media to be social. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they don't want to be social. It's really mis- it, it, the, the name is not appropriate. It's not social media. It's a bitch fest. <laughs> and all they want to do, all they want to do is make you look bad. And you got to understand that. I still probably have, more dialogue with with people on social media than anybody else that does what I do uh, for a living. And I'll probably continue to be that way. That's who I am. But the moment I identify that they're out of bounds, I, I either uh, block them or I, I, I just dismiss them, say something uh, equally dismissive and say the hell with you and move on. But that 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 would be my only critique of Dabo. What we're seeing here is um, uh, the end of, of, of coaches that are um, have made their images and um, and their uh, their beliefs of uh, hey I'm just like anybody else I just happen to coach your football team you know the Bobby Bowden approach which I think is a little bit more what Dabo is mm-hmm. is about those days are gone those days are gone you can't uh, you can't all shucks people anymore and have people go away saying well what he was really nice about that people don't want to go there uh, they just want to say. Uh, you're making, you know, 10 plus million a year and you're four and four, get the hell out. We don't want you anymore. That's what they want to do. And that's how they approach things. And I I don't think it's uh, necessarily indigenous to head football coaches. I think it's just a, that's the way our country is now. Uh, People are rude to one another regularly. You see it all the time. Just go to a ticket counter uh, at an airport. You'll see it all the time. Yeah. Tim, I think the only, like, where he kind of lost me was, you know, where he he shouldn't have even talked about the money he's making. He's earned that money. He doesn't have to prove it yeah. to, to anybody. But when he said he started out as the lowest and now he's this, like, yes, I know you're trying to say you worked hard, but also where it's going to fall on deaf ears is that the lowest paid FBS coach is the best damn job you can get. Like, it's a great job money-wise. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. those are the no, things. But is- that happens when you're angry, I guess. Yeah, I think in his mind, he's thinking I was a GA. You yeah. know, I, 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 when I got into this business, I was having to sell some telephone books like a mm-hmm. lot of assistant coaches did back in those days. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's what he was thinking, but it doesn't land that way, to your point. Mm-hmm. Okay, it, it doesn't land with your ears the way he feels in his heart what he's trying to say, what he's trying to transmit. You're right. It's an excellent point. How does and or how do you think – the college football playoff committee will handle Michigan. Is it as they are now or will there be, well, we think they're one, but man, we'll look bad if we put them there because how do you do that? Oh, I think there's, um, you know, we live in a world as my partner, Spencer Tillman loves to say, we live in a world of images and impressions. And uh, I think two, uh, two things. I don't think Michigan will be number one in the first CFP. I don't think it's about what the issues are uh, with Connor Stallions or any of the, the stuff that's going on with uh, the NCAA or alleged uh, wrongdoing by Michigan. I think it's about the lack of strength of schedule versus a strength of schedule for Ohio State. I think Ohio State will be number one tonight. And I think Michigan will be the second Big Ten team that could either be two, three, or four, but I think will probably be four. I think Georgia would be 
uh, probably three and two will be uh, Florida State. And I think the reason that Florida State will be two and Ohio State will be one is because of strength of schedule, which which the committee loves to put out there as an image and impression that really matters to them. And they love to do it early in the process because early in the process, they're not committing to those teams actually being in the CFP. Okay. The, the brands matter more when we get to the end. Okay. That's when you see teams go from sixth, like Ohio state to fourth or what was it? Seventh to fourth and TCU dropped from third to sixth, you know, mm. <laughs> you know, in that first one back in 2014, you guys remember that well. Oh, yeah. Because Baylor tied for the Big 12 championship that season. Uh, but I do think that it makes uh, not only sense because they can use strength of schedule, okay, as their, their reasoning, but at the same time, a lot of those committee members can be saying, no way in hell I'm putting them number one based on what allegedly has been going on. Okay. They hold ill will towards Michigan. And they're going to do whatever they can to rank them lower than than maybe they deserve to be if given the opportunity. And this gives them a great opportunity because Michigan's not played anybody. Uh, but they've been killing everybody. See, that's why I've got them number one. I base it on performance. Michigan's uh, point spread, I think, is uh, averaging 38 points, the differential between their opponents, by far and away uh, the most dominant team of the, the ones that are undefeated right now. So I've got Michigan one, I've got uh, uh, Georgia two, Florida State, uh, and Ohio State in that order. And I just think the committee will probably flip-flop Ohio State and Michigan tonight. That's that's what I foresee uh, in tonight's CFP first uh, standings. Yeah, and Tim, this is... All in all, this is just a television show because everything they say doesn't mean yeah. anything because there's a lot more evidence yeah. that has to happen. Right. And really, all they, all they need, and this is, if I was on the committee, this is what I, I would want. I need a reason to take you out, not to put you in most of the time. Because yeah. Yeah. putting you in is, is usually pretty easy for two or three teams. And then I need right. reasons to, right. to out. We, I, we learned it here in Waco the first year of the CFP when Baylor, when the Big 12 just handed them the reason that they needed was, oh, we don't have a mm-hmm. championship game and we won't tell you who we think won. <laughs> and they're like, well, thanks. Yeah. That's great. Now, yeah. we, now we have a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they gave them an out, no doubt about it. And we saw it from – great distance, you know, mm-hmm. that they were going to do that. Mm-hmm. And it was a shame that it happened that way. But I don't know that even if they had, hadn't done that, I still believe after what Ohio state did to Wisconsin in the big 10 title game, mm-hmm. they would have jumped them anyway, because brands are what matters to them. And as long as we only have four teams, that's going to be the case uh, next year. Now that'll be fun. You know, I, tonight will serve as a reminder of how this sucks. Okay. And how, and how it blows to have only four teams getting in when you've got this many really good teams out there that you know, you know, have um, the ability to knock out other teams. By example, uh, five and six, I believe, in order will be Washington and Oregon. And right now, on a neutral field, I'd pick either one of those teams to beat Florida State or Ohio State. Right now, I would. Okay, and I saw Washington – almost spit the bit last week against Stanford of all people. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But the thing, that, but the thing you notice about Washington is they can turn it on when they want. They got elite receivers. They've got an elite quarterback. Uh, they were a little bit under the weather last week. A little bit of a flu bug was going through the system. And I think that, uh, uh, Kalen DeBoer, I think honestly felt like, okay, we're just going to be vanilla here. We'll do what we have to do to win this game. We don't need to show anything. They, they, they laid an egg last week against uh, Arizona State, and you could argue they laid an egg against Stanford. But the reality is, does it really matter? No, it doesn't. They need to be at their best when they play the best, and all of that is in front of them. You know, Washington's got a gauntlet coming up, and uh, in the Pac-12, clearing that gauntlet is, is going to be the key. And um, – you know, the, the one thing that hurts Washington, and they know this, is right now the civil war between Oregon and Oregon State looks to be a better game than uh, the Apple Cup with Wazoo kind of going backwards in that last weekend in a, in a rivalry game. So there's more for Washington to lose and there to lose in their 
rivalry game the final week of the season, Thanksgiving weekend, than, than Oregon has. Uh, you know, Oregon State's got two L's. That was a tough loss for them at Arizona. But I think it only bolsters the fact that, you know, the Pac-12 is just loaded with a lot of really good teams. Even the so-called bad teams uh, can jump up and get you. You know, Arizona's got one of the most uh, uh, underrated teams the last four weeks of this season. Not many people know anything about them. But just ask Jonathan Smith about them. You know, uh, that, that's a really good football team right now, playing at a very high level. And, guys, <laughs> when you see the way these teams are playing, the Big 12 should be salivating at what's in store for them when they come into the league. Because I'm here to tell you, other than Oklahoma State, right now what Mike Gundy has done since that loss against South Alabama, I mean, who can really be, you know, walking with uh, a little pep in their step right now in the Big 12 besides OU and Texas, more so Texas now than OU, but who besides Oklahoma State? I mean, Gundy has got it going on again. Yep. And, and as I look at Arizona State, as I look at Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, my God, those four teams are going to come in with instant street cred into the Big 12. So it's going to be fun to watch next year in both the league and how everything shakes out nationally when we go to 12 teams. And uh, we'll have 12 for one year, and I think we're going to go to 16 right after that. Tim, you mentioned Kalen DeBoer a second ago, and he was smaller school than Fresno State and then Washington. Lance Leipold Lance 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 in the West. Lance Leipold in the West. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do more schools can't look at Washington and Kansas and what they've done and say, okay, who are the next Lance Leipolds and Kalen DeBoers of this? Mike Gundy did it with his defensive coordinator, and that's starting to actually kind of work out for him uh, as well. Yeah. Like, look – if you think a guy is a good coach and he is coaching really well with, you know, bargain basement parts, like, don't yeah. you think you could maybe be good if you gave him the keys to the kingdom? Yeah, I think so. And, uh, you know, when you look at uh, Kansas and, and uh, Washington, what, what's, the, what's the common theme with both teams? A staff that for the most part has been together with the coach, you know, all the time. Okay, uh, from Sioux Falls, you know, at the NAIA level, up through Fresno, and and now to Washington for DeBoer, and from, you know, Wisconsin Whitewater to Buffalo to shuffling off to Lawrence mm -hmm. with uh, Borland and on the defensive side and Andy Kotelnicki, who I think is one of the best offensive coordinators in the country, bar none. And these guys are part, I mean, they're part of the package. You know, you hire some of these other coaches. Uh, what's the first and foremost thing they got to do? They got to assemble a staff. Even Brian Kelly, by example, okay, gets the job at LSU from Notre Dame, but he can't convince Tommy Reese to come with him. Okay, Tommy Reese stays at Notre Dame, but he leaves to go to to, to the Evil Empire in Tuscaloosa to work for Saban, who's going to match up against Brian Kelly this weekend. Most coaches, most head coaches. Uh, especially the, the ones that are bringing in an excess of seven point five million annually, these guys are still in. They still have to assemble staffs. Okay, uh, James Franklin's got a problem at Penn State because he doesn't have an offensive coordinator that can get him to the next level, and he hasn't had one since Joe Moorhead left him after Penn State won the Big Ten title in two thousand fifteen. You know what's Penn State's problem? Why can't they beat Ohio State and Michigan? because they don't have a scheme to match Drew Aller's talent as a quarterback. Well, these coaches, DeBoer and Leipold, they bring their whole staff with them. I mean, it's Johnny Holstaff, and that's a commitment. It's stability, and it's fantastic for anyone that chooses to hire them. Uh, I'm hearing some rumblings out of Iowa uh, now that, um, now that uh, Brian Ferentz is committed to resigning at the end of the year. Uh, will Kirk Ferentz, who's been there 25 years, hang on? Uh, will he continue to be their head coach? I mean, they've got the third winningest program in the Big Ten over the last 12 years. That's pretty good when you consider that league and its strength. But the league's about to change, and it's about to get a lot tougher in that league than it currently is, just as it is in the Big 12. Does, does Kirk want to go through that? 
if Brian's exiting stage right, is that clearing the way for Kirk to, okay, say, I'm willing to change, I'm willing to adapt, go get somebody else? Or is he going to say, you know what, this has been a nice run, I think I'll step aside and uh, go by the way of Hayden Fry. If y'all want to put up a statue, go ahead, because I, I won a lot of football games here. You know, he won over 200 games there. So that's something to think about uh, with Iowa. Will Iowa uh, come out and say, Lance Leipold, we'll give you everything you have at Kansas and then some, plus the infrastructure at Iowa versus KU. If I'm the Jayhawks and I'm their donors, I'm doing everything in my power to solidify the fact that that uh, Lance Leipold is going to stay put because, because he's put them in a – think about it, fellas. They're in a great spot. Other than o- Oklahoma State, it's Kansas, and then who else in the Big 12, the current Big 12, mm-hmm. okay, that's really – you know, getting it done. Chris Kleiman's team is showing some signs. You know, K-State is beginning to show some signs that they're going to be ready for November, and I hope they are. That game with Texas coming up is going to be huge. But um, but they got to they got to string a few more together before they get hot, like Oklahoma State and, and uh, Kansas have been hot, Tim, in my I, opinion. I know you have a game. I believe you're doing Nebraska-Michigan State this weekend. Is that yeah. correct? So, Matt yeah, Rowe, and- good friend. Great friend of the show. Uh, they're five right. and three, which in the past by now they would be two and six or three and five. And of course, Michigan <laughs> yeah. State's been a mess. But you're, I know you haven't been there yet. But your thoughts about uh, about what he's done so far, year one at Nebraska? Well, not surprised at all. Uh, I think um, you know after the first three weeks, people sort of forgot about him. You know, uh, oh gosh, they did. They didn't get it done against Colorado. Mm-mm. They lost the way they've always typically lost when they had the the nation to itself playing that game with Minnesota, you know, to start the season. And then you stop paying attention to them. And all of a sudden they've, uh, they've strung five wins in the last six games. And uh, I gave a shout out uh, via text to my buddy, Larry, the cable guy. And uh, he's fired up. Uh, he, he'd make the trip, but he's, he's going to be in Canada performing at a, at a casino there. He's trying to find a, a satellite that will have a, FS1 coming in on Saturday so you can see the game. But they're pumped, and you know they're going to have a great crowd. Look for this at uh, East Lansing. They may have more Nebraska fans on hand than Spartans fans at Spartan Stadium. I mean, think about that. Uh, There'll be a sea of red in in the land of green, and and, uh, that's the other thing. What's Michigan State going to do? Now we've got a storyline developing about uh, urban renewal again. In college football, I don't know if you guys have seen that, Urban Meyer apparently was seen in East Lansing overnight and uh, into today. And Matt Ishbia, the walk-on for Tom Izzo, who who financed that nine point five year ten year deal for Mel Tucker, uh, and then bought an NBA team. Apparently, he's not run out of money. He's got more to spend. So uh, Urban's name is popping up with that job now. Interesting. Yeah, the storylines we've got for that game. It really is. And normally, Matt year Matt Rule, year one at Temple, year one at Baylor, normally it's it's kind of dummied down a little bit where he just tears yeah. everything down. And then, of course, the next year looks even better. But, uh, they, you know, he's done a pretty good job. Of course, in the west of the Big Ten, there really isn't anybody there that is like an alpha. Uh, you know, Wisconsin is no, not there no. who they are and. And Iowa struggles on offense, so they've been able to get into the meat of the schedule right. that is pretty soft I, right um, now. Right. I do think Wisconsin is on the way to getting there. Phil Longo's offense is is still something that they're adjusting to. Uh, I think that um, uh, Luke Fickle, their defense is always a constant. You saw that against Ohio State. Plus, the Buckeyes just are not, in my opinion, that dynamic anymore. Without Marvin Harrison, what are they? Who are they? I don't think McCord is of the same ilk as the quarterbacks they've had in recent years, any more than Jalen Milrow is to Alabama, what they've been accustomed to the last handful of years. But I think Wisconsin will get right quickly. And I think that, um, you know, those other teams, you got new coaches in there. You know, Brett Bielema has only been there a short time and he lost his go-to defensive coordinator to Purdue when he lost Walters to that job. And that took some of the stability, I thought, away from, Uh, The Illini, who at times last year looked really good, you know, scared some people, including Michigan and Michigan. So uh, that that's a league in transition, and everybody there now knows this. 
you better get good quickly because with Washington and Oregon <laughs> coming in and UCLA too, I mean, they're, they're playing better than SC right now. I think that the number one question in the Pac-12 right now, as opposed to, you know, who are the, will it be Oregon or Washington representing them in the CFP? The number one question now is who's going to win more games, uh, Dion or Lincoln Riley? Yeah. Look at that schedule USC's got left. Yeah, mm-hmm. check that baby out. I know as they skirt as they skirt by Cal uh, fifty to forty nine last week. Yeah, we saw that. By the <laughs> way, many of the people in the chat room love you having on uh, you being on the show every time we can get you, Tim. They all wanted me to tell you yeah. that that we love thank that, you, Tim, Tim. We love him, and and many others that say the same thing. Thank you for your time. Have a great broadcast in East Lansing. You bet. Looking really forward to it. I do think we'll be back in the Big 12 in the coming weeks. Um, I can uh, I can tell you that. We're going to be in the in the Big 12 quite a bit in the stretch run in November, which is always great. So looking forward to that. When Thank you, you for having me on. When you sit down, you and Spencer tell Matt Rule that Smokey, Paul, and Craig said hi. And thank you very I'll much for your time. Appreciate it. All right. You got it. All Tim Rando, Fox Sports. Love the segment. I know you do, too, as the audience.